welcome everyone to our, our uh, Australian Speech Minority Faculty uh, Seminar. Today we have a PhD in getting a job in academia with her Dr. Destiny Knott. She's uh, actually kind of sat in y'all's shoes. Uh, she was an undergraduate here, uh, graduated back in 2014, right? Yeah. So uh, currently Dr. Knock is an assistant professor with a joint appointment in civil and environmental engineering and engineering policy, engineering and public policy at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, her research focuses on energy planning and equitable human service systems. Here she uses mathematical, mathematical modeling, optimization and decision analysis to ask questions like, how can we make sure the future energy uh, system is more sustainable and how can we make sure uh, people have access to quality food. She earned her PhD from the University of Massachusetts Amherst in industrial engineering. She also holds a Bachelor of Science from uh, North Carolina State, North Carolina A&T State University in Electrical Engineering and Applied Mathematics. Uh, in her free time, she runs a blog uh, on her personal website, www.destinynock.com, which offers graduate student and career advice. So you might want to check that out, especially on those times, those late nights when you're getting discouraged and wanting some some help or some advice from someone who's recently gone through the through the struggles and whatnot and what have you. So uh, please welcome. Oh, Dr. Nakin. Also she has some swag over here. So if you want to pick up some some trinkets and things, you know, and of course you have a tag there, you know, get get PhD, maybe kind of where to kind of get you encouraged in some of those long nights as well. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Nakin. Okay, thanks Dr. Doc. Um, so today I'm going to basically boil down for you everything I learned in the last three years. Okay, so I would say that my job market experience started in my second year of my PhD because that's when I started practicing networking, right? So UMass Amherst, like some people know it, some people don't. It's not like a name brand, I would say. Like of a, you hear the, you know, most people are like, oh, Massachusetts, is that MIT? And I'm like, no. They're like, hmm, okay. So like, where is it? <laughs> right? And I'm like, well, it's in Amherst. That's why it's called UMass Amherst, right? So I would say that networking is um, probably one of the most important things that you can do when you're trying to get a job. Um, and so, okay, so let me see. What's your degree? Electrical engineering. Can everybody just go? Industrial systems. Okay. Industrial systems. Industrial systems. Wow. Okay. Leadership studies. Okay. Applied science and technology. Okay. So um, within those respective fields, right, there's a bunch of people also trying to get a job. So the best time to look for a job is when you're when you don't actually need one. Right? Um, and so have you guys ever heard of the Institute on Teaching and Mentoring? No. So the Institute of Teaching and Mentoring is the largest gathering of minority PhDs in the country, right? And so a lot of um, a lot of schools will go there to actually recruit. Yeah, that's Institute of Teaching and Mentoring if you want to write it down. Um, and so you can actually go there as like a volunteer if the school doesn't send you, but you can also like look as a part of your program. So that is actually where I met the people that then passed on my resume that got me an interview that then let, lets me get hired at Carnegie Mellon, okay? So network, network, network. It's not just about getting a job, it's about setting yourself up for the rest of your career, right? You're meeting your potential colleagues, you're meeting people that you might wanna collaborate with later. You're meeting like people your own age so that you guys can write papers together and then you're also meeting people that have done this before you so that you can learn from them, right? And so then once you do all this networking, don't be afraid to reach out to people. Um, so when I was going onto the job market, I'll just give you a bit of um, my application process. So I applied to 58 jobs. Um, and I think about 15 of those were outside of academia. Because I knew that no matter what happened in my last year of grad school, and I say last year, because it doesn't really matter how many years you're in, right? Your last year, you went into your last year, I just want to be done, right? I wanted people to pay me to think and pay me to not be in school anymore. Right, so I don't really buy into the whole, like you have to choose between academia or industry or what have you. I just say apply wherever you think you could be happy, right? And then 
if you don't like it after a year, you apply to something else and you move on. And so while I was on the job market talking to a lot of these mentors from all this networking, they would always tell me about their path, right? And I met a guy that got a tenure track job at Temple, wrote a bunch of papers, started a company, didn't get tenure because the he didn't have proper mentoring, left, ran his company, now he's at Auburn University, right? So, and now he has tenure. I met a person that started at ECU and then now she's at Wisconsin, right? And so you hear about all these paths, like just because you start someplace doesn't mean you're gonna end in that place. And so I think that too many times we think we're gonna be locked in in like our first year on the job, right? Um, and so then second thing is you gotta know your work, okay? So um, how many people think that they are rock stars at their research? Okay, so we're all in the same, oh man, <laughs> we're not all in the same boat. So this, guy, this lady's in front of us. Um, so can you tell me what you do? I would just summarize it. I would say empowering Alzheimer's caregivers through the use of a mobile health application. Okay, so that's really good. Um, and why should you be hired over the person next to you? That's a good question. <laughs> that is a good question, and everybody will ask you, right? So everybody will ask you that question no matter where you are. So when you're networking, you got to know your worth. Because they're going to ask you at some point. They're going to be like, so why do you want to work here? Right? You got to know about their school. And you got to know about their department. Right? You can't just be like, well, I've been in school for 10 plus years and I'm tired of being in PhD. And I would like a job because you guys are hired. Right? <laughs> you got to say something that's a little bit more um, like you've looked into it a little bit. Like, you know, I heard that you guys are really good at collaboration. Um, I met so and so at the last conference and they made it seem like a very warm inviting department. You guys are leaders in AI, and my work bridges the gap between AI and something else, right? Any of these one sentence things give people something to hold on to, right? Something that says you cared about their place more than just their name brand, right? Um, okay, yeah, so know your worth. And also, like, knowing your worth helps you understand how to brand yourself, too. So, did you guys all see the flyer? That, no? Nobody saw the flyer? This flyer? Yeah. yeah. Okay, and who do you think wrote that flyer? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's important to brand yourself, right? Like one time I wrote a flyer and it said, Dusting Enough is a leader in equity and in energy planning, right? I don't know if I'm a leader really. I just started. How can you be a leader this quickly, right? But if people think that you're a leader, people will start labeling you as a leader. And the first person that should label you as a leader or the up and coming or the transformative or the person that's changing the game is yourself, right? Because when you believe it, you can be confident about it, right? And I mean, so I always say people like, if you're not confident, that's okay. Just fake it. Just pretend like you're on stage, like you're in theater and you're just gonna fake it till you make it. Um, so yeah, I applied to 58 jobs. Let's see, those happened in October. I got my first call for like a conference interview in, let's say like October, November-ish, right? And I was freaking out. Okay, so like mega freaking out. I'm going to this conference, I got like six interviews lined up. And I'm, so the first one, I go in and the guy's like, who are you, what do you do, what do you wanna teach, what do you wanna research? Okay, cool, we're done, thank you. And I was like, oh my God, I feel like I could throw up right now. Like it was just so intense. Right? Because it's only 20 minutes to sell yourself. And you're like, how can I make these people know how great I am in only 20 minutes? I've spent four years in this PhD. Right? Um, and so you just have to like smile, breathe, and just try to leave before you say something stupid. Um, or cut yourself off before you say something stupid. And so, so then after that happened, I got my first call for an like, on-campus interview in December. Right? So on campus interview, call in December, the, the interview's in February. So I'm like, okay, great. I have a lot of time to prepare. So I'm gonna make my job talk. I'm gonna make sure I have my stuff locked down in PowerPoint form. And I set up a meeting with my advisor and my committee members to practice in January after Christmas break, right? So then next thing I know, like my February is filled up with interviews. And basically I would leave one interview and fly, to, I was gonna fly to the other. And when, I got the call from Carnegie because I 
went to the conference in the end of October, and I got a call from the department chair saying like, hey, we want to call you and tell you more about our program, right? So I'm like, okay, cool, that sounds great. How will we talk on Friday, and it's Monday? Well, then Wednesday hits me, right? Like, wait a second, this guy's gonna tell me about the program? He's gonna interview me, right? And so that's why, like, my last point is, don't get ready, just stay ready, right? So when you are on the job market, you have to have your pitch, right? You had your pitch, she was ready. You have to know your worth. You gotta be ready to tell people why you are valuable and why your work is valuable. Basically the introduction that you wrote for your dissertation or your interview papers, right? And so then when you do get the call and you do get the opportunity, you want to be ready and you want to have like, you know, what classes do you think you could teach? You probably know that because you've taken a bunch of classes throughout your lifetime, right? For me, I had never been in engineering public policy, so it did take me a little bit more work to figure out what do they even teach, right? And people told me, don't just list grad school classes. You want to list a couple of grad school, maybe one undergrad and one new one to show that you're bringing an idea to the table because they're thinking about where they're going to go in the future. Um, and then they want to, he did ask me first thing, first question he asked me on the phone. So Destiny, what do you know about us? And I'm like, well, I know you guys, you know, we're made 40 years ago. I was talking to the guy that started the department. So I had watched a video he made and, you know, just that five minutes of preparation, I think saved me a lot of like pride, like dignity <laughs> um and it should be said oh like i just can see that you actually care about us let me tell you a little bit more right so that's at the tone of the conversation that i'm actually interested in and i was taking it serious um and so then after that he says okay well where do you want to go in the future that question actually means what is your five to ten year plan right they want to know what projects do you want to work on what, um, how are you gonna get funding? In engineering schools, it's very important that you bring in your own grants. Um, so if he says, okay, like, so for me, I'd say I do energy policy planning with a focus on equity. And I do this in two facets. The first is in New England, and I look at sustainable development and how can we make sure that we're transitioning to a more sustainable future. And the second part, I look at Liberia, and I wanna make sure that we're planning the power system in an equitable way that does not leave out the, the most vulnerable members of society. So then, because I kept it very high level, right? So you wanna make sure you keep it high level at the beginning. That way they can ask you more questions because the best interviews feel like conversations. And they actually say, the more you let other people talk, the better they feel the interview went, right? So you wanna, um, so then after that, he's like, okay, that Africa stuff is cool, but tell me a little bit more about <laughs> Um, the New England work, like what were what were some of your methods that you used? I mean, ended up talking for 15, 15 minutes about what he was interested in, but if I had gone too deep too fast, I would have probably spent more time on my Liberia work because that's where I was most interested, right? So you're trying to make it ebb and flow, like a conversation. Um, and so then, yeah, the future, there's a bunch of future faculty workshops as well that people will actually pay you to come out. Um, and so these, like I went to one at Clemson, it's called Pathfinder, and they bring out a ton of people from across disciplines. Um, Berkeley Next Prop has a, um, brings out a lot of engineers, and um, there's like a Virginia Tech one, RIT. So I would just say like, make sure you kind of Google future faculty workshops because this is networking, but small group, right? They're gonna set up meetings with you for your department um so that you can actually meet with these people and when i was at clips and i met with the department chair a year later i was at the conference interviewing and in the middle somebody came up to me and was like hey destiny like do you remember me and i'm like yes hi sandra right and um she then said our department chair is looking for you he wants to know if you're actually on the job market this year and they didn't have a call in energy that year but they told me like let's talk and let's see if we can make something Right? And so that's why I say you should network before you're on the job market, because then you're also giving people to prepare for you. And also because you're like early stages, a lot of people want to help. Um, and I'm surprised at how many people want to help, but a lot of people want to help. And so I've had like at least three different people at three different universities read my job statements. Right, the job statements, um, the research statement, your teaching statement, sometimes your diversity statement and your cover letter, 
the about six pages, seven pages that you're going to send off in all your and all of your um, applications, right? No six pages can make you more money in your lifetime if you're on an academic job market. If you're on an industry job market, it's like three pages for your resume. No three pages will make you more money in your lifetime. So it's in your best interest to have as many people read them as possible, right? And give you the outside perspectives outside of your advisor. And so one thing that these people told me was my first job statement was terrible, right? It was really bad. I spent, out of the two pages, I spent a page talking about my dissertation. Because that's what I've been trained to do, right? And they're like, no, we, we want to know what are your future projects? Where are you going to get money? And what do you want to do in your lifetime, like in your career? And so then from that, I ended up flipping it on its head, right? I, they told me, use bullet points, bold it. Here's my example. I mean, it's, I can send you guys my example if you choose to ask for it or if you would prefer to have it. Um, but just having like an actual template makes, changes the game because it makes it in a way that people actually want to read it. And half the time, people just get tired of seeing walls and walls of text, right? And so if you can bold, underline, bullet point, I mean, that will actually set you apart from most of the competition. Because now that I've been like reviewing certain people's job materials, it's amazing how many of them are in ways that are just walls of text. You know, like if you're reading, if people, um, so I heard that Georgia Tech gets like 200 applications to their industrial engineering department, right? 200. So you can imagine like needing to take out information quickly and people are not going to read everything in detail, right? They just don't have the time because they're not paid to hire good people, right? They're paid to get the research, they're paid to bring in grants and they're paid to graduate their students. Um, so those are my big high level things. Oh, I was going to tell you about what the interview's like. Do you guys care about that part? Okay, cool. I was like, I'm just looking at your faces and y'all look tired. So I'm just trying to gauge a little bit about where we should go. Um, so the interview process. So when you actually get the on-campus interview, that's when you know you're basically golden because they're not flying everybody out. So that means you're in the top three to five. You should just take a moment and like, just let that sink in and just be happy. Um, so when I got the call for Carnegie, um, as I told you before, my original interviews had all been set up for February, right? And end of January. Well, Carnegie called me and they're like, hey, we want you to come out for an interview. And I'm like, dancing in my chair. I'm like, yes, celebrate now, right? And then they're like, I'm like, great, like, when can I come? And they said, okay, well, where else are you interviewing? So I told them the other places. And they're like, okay, we want you to come in December. And I'm like, well, how about January? And they're like, well, Harvard chair is going to be out of town. Like, this guy's going to be out of town. You have to come in December, and that's when you have to come. I said, okay. So now you can see that this is why I'm suggesting to you guys to stay ready, because I was going to practice in Christmas break, right? I hadn't made my job statements yet. I hadn't done, I mean, I hadn't made my job statements. I hadn't made my job PowerPoint yet. I hadn't practiced interviews yet. Um, but because I had done those future faculty development workshops where I was meeting with people and giving a talk as these other people, school people told me that basically was job interview practice. Um, and so even though I had all that practice, I mean, my advisor, she said I looked like death, like, like the day after. I was so nervous because I really, really wanted it. You know, and like when, when everything that you're wanting to sit in front of you, it's hard to like not freak out, right? I mean, we freak out on the PhD all the time. So I was like in the gym. I got a personal trainer at that point because I had gained a lot a lot of weight, and I was getting married in June. My mom told me my dress wouldn't zip, so as you can imagine, if you're stressed out because you're not graduating, and you're, I mean, because you want to graduate and you're on the job market, and you're planning a wedding in June, and your dress doesn't fit, you're like, oh my god, like, what's happening with my life right now? So I got a trainer, and I'm in the gym, and I'm doing this one. I never know the names of them, so I'm just gonna, sorry for the people online, you can't see me doing the motions, but it's this one, and I just broke down crying. And my trainer was like, what in the world just happened? He's like, this exercise is not that hard. We're going light right now. And I'm like, you don't understand. Like, I'm stressed. I like, I don't know like, if I'm going to get it. Like, I don't know why these people call me. Because, you know, you have all this other noise about, it's great that they're hiring more minorities now. It's great that they're hiring more women now. It's great that affirmative action is helping you out. And you're like, 
I don't want to be the diversity candidate, but these people also didn't tell me I was a diversity candidate at Carnegie. I think that I'm good, but I want to make sure I'm really good and I'm here now and I just don't want to blow it because I'm so close, right? And so I was just a mess. And he told me, he was like, get your mind right. Like, go run until you can't think anymore because you just are thinking too much, right? PhDs, classics, we think too much. Um, and you said, if you want to be mentally healthy, you got to be physically healthy, right? And so that's just taking a break from doing everything that you're doing to just try to let it all go. So I ran on the treadmill, and I don't like running, but you told me to do it, so I ran. And then I, I actually could think straight, right? Like my stress was basically contained because I couldn't like think enough to be stressed. And then I was thinking, okay, like I got this. I need to make a pump up playlist with the most ratchet music I could find to like help me get my mind right. You know what I mean? Um, so there's this one, it's like, it's by Halsley, it's called Castle. And in the song, she's like, I'm headed straight to the castle. They're about to make me my queen. And there's an old man sitting on the throne there. And he was telling me I shouldn't be so mean. And I was like, oh my God, this is like ivory tower of academia. I'm going to this castle and I'm going to kill it. You know what I mean? So then I would play that every morning before my interview. And I also went to the gym before my interview because the whole cardio thing helped, right? Um, and so then what I found was like, when I started actually going to the gym again and like exercising and doing other stuff besides preparing for job interviews and working my dissertation in my free time, I like was just happier, right? And like when you're on the job market, your goal is to show them your best self, but your best professional self. Right? So you don't want to be this grad student that doesn't know what they want to do in the future. Right? You want to be this confident person that knows they're going to get grants, that knows they're going to graduate students. And everybody's like, well, you've never graduated PhD students before. How do you know you're going to be successful? And you have to say, well, I know I'm going to be successful because I've spent my whole life preparing for this moment and blah, blah, blah. And in your mind, you're thinking, I don't know. <laughs> you guys keep asking me these same questions, and I don't know. Right? I, I want to be successful and I want it bad enough that I think I could be successful, but I don't know because we never know. And so I felt like when you're, the self that you show to the world becomes more disconnected from the self that you feel inside, it's just like you're tearing at the seams, right? And so that's why you got to like take your moment to like recenter yourself and just be okay with not being okay sometimes because the job market is really stressful. Um, but yeah, so now back to the point, the beginning, when I asked you guys if you want to the interview process and stuff. So that was everything I was filling inside, so that's not how, that's not what I showed up, right? Because we're at A&T, Aggies do not show all their emotions all the time, right? So on the interview, it's basically like you start off 9 a.m. and you're getting breakfast with somebody. It could be the grad school program coordinator, uh, it could be the department chair, or maybe the dean, right? And so you, they're going to... They could try to tell you all the fun, good stuff about, you know, bringing in diversity. This is where the college is going in a couple of years. You're just having breakfast, right? Um, might be like an hour, 30 minutes to an hour. And so you want to have like some high level questions that make you seem like that you're forward thinking. You know, like you can ask about tenure process. They probably know it. Um, you can also ask like, where do you see the college going in the next four years? What do you hope that candidate will bring? to the university, you know, like where, which research areas do you see yourself as strong in now and where do you hope that it will go in the future, right? And I actually had a notebook with these questions in it because I can talk, I can talk all day, but after about four people, it all starts to go downhill, okay? So I had, um, I don't think I brought my notebook now, but I had a notebook and I had asked them to send me the schedule of people I was going to meet with in advance. So what I did was I had people, in order, I was going to meet with them, three questions for each person in case the conversation stalled. And then I had three words about what that person did, right? It changed the game, okay? Like little things because people do not care if you have a notebook in front of you. They actually like that you're prepared and they like it if you're writing things down because that makes you seem more interested. And really, I was just trying to write things down so I could send a very like well thought out thank you for meeting with me and talking with me about XYZ that you spoke about in our meeting, email, right? Because um, you want it to be remembered. So
So yeah, so having those three questions was really helpful because so then so sorry after breakfast then you go meet with professors in the department those that are thinking of recruiting you you might work with them um, and it's about 20 to 30 minute meetings um, until lunchtime go get lunch more meetings and you have a seminar the seminar can be in the morning could be in the evening I had a lunch seminar one time um, and they're gonna get dinner with some people then it's gonna be nine o'clock you're gonna be done so it's a marathon right and that's why like some of the small things to make your interview go smoother are writing down those questions, but also making sure you bring a snack. So I had almonds in my like, coat pocket, and when I would like ask to go to the bathroom, I would eat some while I was in there and just like take a moment to like recenter myself, basically talking to myself in the mirror, like, come on, girl, you got this, like do the power pose that everybody tells you to like make you feel more confident, look stupid, that's what you do in the bathroom, you like Superman pose, just like feel strong or something. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of how the interview goes. Um, so just as a recap, right, you got to know your worth because people are going to ask you why they should hire you, not the other person. And you want to make sure you tell them what you brought to the table in your PhD. Don't say in my dissertation, my advisor and I did X, Y, Z. Yeah, that's like grad student mentality. Like colleague mentality is in my current work, I am responsible for X, Y, Z, right? So it's just a slight word shift because when um, academics hear dissertation, they think of their students. When they hear current work, they think of a colleague. And it's these little things that can actually just make you seem like more professional, like that you're already there. You know what I mean? Okay. And then network, network, network. It's about not just getting a job, but setting yourself up to be successful in your job. Because now a lot of these people that have networked over the, with over the years, now they have this job, they're like, oh, like, what do you want to do? Like, I remember we talked about this like a year ago. Are you still interested in working on that? Like, we should try to write that paper, right? And one of the things that a lot of successful academics do is they have a ton of collaborators. So they're collaborating with these people. And when they're collaborating with these other people, they're citing their other, they're citing their other work. Right? And then they're citing their friends' works. And so if we can build those networks out, I mean, that just makes the job a lot easier because it's easier to get grants when you're having like multi-institution, collaborative network, right? And you're right now you're making that network. And then um, last one is don't get ready, just stay ready, right? So when you are on the job market, right, you got to have your pitch. You want to have the 30-second pitch in case you're in the elevator with somebody. The two-minute pitch for when they actually are sitting down at breakfast with you and they want to ask you what you do, the high level stuff. And then you want to have the five minute for when they want to know a little bit more details and you can mix them and match them if necessary. Okay. So now I guess we can go to questions. Anybody has questions? Yeah. Um, have you ever had an interview where the recruiter was not prepared for the interview? And do you have any advice for if that ever happens? Because it's happened to me a few times. Like, was it for academia? Nope, for industry. Okay. Um, so I didn't get any industry interviews. Um, uh, but I would say, like, I mean, if, if they're unprepared for the interview, one, I mean, to me, that might be a bad sign about, like, company assistance or company prep, or if they mean you know, what they say, I don't know what job you're looking for, but um, one, I think that's also where, like, having questions that are prepared helps, because it does kind of give people a little bit more time to think on their feet if you're, like, probing them with questions that can, like, go in, like, a linear fashion. Um, yeah, I mean, so, like, I guess my only um, thing that would kind of be similar is that one time I sat down in this guy's office, he said, so tell me why we're here. <laughs> I wanted to be like, I thought you would know. Because <laughs> they brought me to campus, right? And so um, so then I like looked at my notebook and I was like, well, I know that you do work in innovation. And I was just hoping like if we could see where there are some overlaps in our work because I'm interested in energy. Right? And he's like, oh, okay. Yeah, you're the new candidate. Right? Um, and they, I mean, they have done that to a couple of Minority professors, because I mean, to be honest, there's not that many at these schools that at the R1s. Um, 
I mean, I guess in general, there's not that many. And especially at the R1s, there's not that many. Like, I think I'm, so I was the first black female College of Engineering hired. So as you can imagine, they didn't have any other black females to meet with me, my interviews. And when I got there, I doubled the number of black faculty in the College of Engineering. So now there's four new ones. Um, so in my year, they brought in four. Um, but while they're interviewing, there was only one guy. And he was like, so why? Like, I like, looked at the schedule and I was like, this guy does semiconductors? Like, he's in electrical engineering? Like, why the heck is this guy on my schedule? Right? And I Googled him and I was like, oh, he's black. <laughs> that makes sense, right? So then I was like, okay, they're, they're trying to show me some diversity or whatever. So then I meet with him and he was like, Oh, hey, hey, like, how's it going? And I'm like, it's going good. And he's like, so, like, why are we, why are we meeting? And I'm like, well, I'm interviewing in um, civil and EPP, uh, engineering public policy. And he goes, oh, that's great. Like, and so then he, like, knew why I was there, right? But I think he thought I was a student, probably. <laughs> like, if, if, like, some people have thought that I was a grad student coming in when I'm on these interviews for this faculty position. And I'm like, no, I am not just up for the career fair. I'm not dressed up because I'm interviewing for grad schools. I'm interviewing for an assistant professor position. Um, <laughs> so you just try to laugh it off because you don't want to seem like it. And you just try to smile. Um, you're like, so, you know, I'm here, still here. And I thought they would tell you I was coming because <laughs> I prepared, you know. So, um, yeah, like you just try to roll with the bunches. Um, I got a lot of... Like, so I did like, uh, let me see, I did like 20 uh, conference and um, on the phone type of interview conversations. And then I had eight on campus interviews. So I've seen a wide spectrum of preparedness and unpreparedness. And one time I was there to meet with people and one guy just forgot about the meeting and had was hosting a seminar speaker. And so he didn't have time to meet with me either. And it kind of, you know, helped me gauge, you know, who would I actually collaborate with? Who's going to be interested enough in collaborating with new people coming in? Um, so that was also something that was really helpful. Any other questions on that? Okay. Hi. Um, what advice do you have for coming out with an elevator pitch? Right. So I would say um, use your family. Right, because they're always trying to know what you do. And I found that if, so I would tell my mom, right? And I'd be like, you can't ask me any questions. Tell me what you heard me say. So the first time I told my mom, I was like, okay, my work is in decision analysis. And I use multi-criteria decision analysis methods to look at the way we plan our power systems because we have different stakeholders and we need to make sure that their objectives are not going to conflict and that we can get to a more sustainable future. Now, as you can imagine, my mom couldn't really remember what I did, right? And so um, I would say that you have to, um, so normally we talk about like our methods a lot, then we talk about what we're going to do, and then we like to talk about the problem at the end of our paper, right, and how we solved it. And so I would say you have to flip it with like, you have to talk about big picture, high level, right? Then you talk about how you solved it, and then you talk about your methods at, towards the end, when you're just pitching, because um, when you're on the job market, it is your job to label yourself as a blank, blank person, right? So that they can remember you. It's basically like a tweet. You wanna make sure people can remember you as a tweet. So I'm Destiny, I am the energy policy and equity person, right? Now, granted, you can change this in your, throughout your career. Like right now, I have like expanded to like equity and human service systems. So I'm looking at energy systems. I'm looking at food. Um, but it's like, what do you want to do? Right? Who do you want to be? And you want to tell people who you want to be so that they know how to, I guess, package you, right? And it's also just being memorable. Because they say that the number one um, – like a sign of a new professor is saying that they can do way too much because like you don't like it's hard to know your limitations right and you think that you can manage students code write the papers and apply to the grants you can do it all yourself 
right? And you can collaborate and work on five different projects, and you just can't, right? So, um, yeah, like knowing your limitations and like having like a defined view of like what you want to do and where you want to go, being a little bit flexible, but not like, you know, I'm Hercules and I can do everything, right? Like I'm just gonna bust my way through all these walls, right? You gotta like take steps. So yeah, you can label yourself as the blank, blank, blank person. I think that's helpful. And talking to your family, like your grandma, you know, probably really did. And letting you know if you can pitch yourself to a wide range of audiences. I also, um, I also talked to the middle school. So I had like designed to talk to talk to these kids and I'd be like, okay, so like, do you guys have any questions? And they'd be like, no. I'm like, so can anybody tell me what I do? And they're like, energy. And I'm like, okay, that one stuck. Equity didn't stick, right? So I have to try to figure out a way to like make it stick. And then also your friends, I mean, because like you want to, you know, make sure if you're if you're doing the five minute pitch and you want to go into detail, that's when you use people in your lab and your advisor. If you're doing like the one minute pitch, you're in the elevator, then you want to make sure you're talking to like more general audience, that's your family members. And I would say talk to talk. Do not write it down first. We think differently when, when we write than when we do them. Uh, we think differently when we write than we do when we speak. So if you're doing a really short pitch, it's better to speak it first, get it right, and then write it down. Most people try to do it the opposite way, and then half the time you're just trying to remember what you wrote. Oh, are there any online questions? Is there anybody there? Okay, if you're online, please type in your questions, and we have a member of the audience that will read them to us so we can all hear them. All right? Hi. Hi. Well, I'll call we have a class. It's okay. So I guess a brief synopsis. Definitely not. Okay. I'm an assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon in civil engineering and engineering public policy. I did my undergrad here, master's in Ireland, PhD in UMass Amherst. I just graduated in May. Started my job in August. Here talking about getting a job in academia. The highlights were know your worth. They're going to ask you why they should hire you, not somebody else. You got to know how you brand yourself. You want to label yourself as the blank, blank, blank person. It makes it easier to digest and hold on to. Network, network, network. Getting a job starts before you're on the job market. It makes it less stressful for you. You get to practice and people give you feedback. And then last one. Oh, don't get ready, stay ready. So when people are asking you, what do you do? What do you want to do? You want to have some sort of something to say, right? And it can change as you go. I've changed a lot um, from when I started. But you want to just make sure that if somebody, if you're sitting down with somebody and they're saying, so what do you want to do in the future? Like, you know, um, and you can say, for me, I said, well, I want to make sure that power systems across the world are equitable. And like, okay, well, like, what do you do? Tell me a little bit more about yourself. That's kind of interesting. That's a summary. <laughs> All right, any other questions? I have a question. Yeah. When you came from an HBCU like a and that was not well known throughout the country, um, and somebody questioned your credibility, how did you handle that? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so I think sometimes the way I handled it depended on who I was talking to. Um, like my under, my uh, uncle sometimes was like, well, you had this degree from a and it's not like a degree from MIT, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, really, because I didn't, I think we used the same book, right? Um, or, oh, I thought that education was universal. That's it, but that's, so those are sometimes my short things. Now, in a professional setting, I normally say um, something along the lines of, you know, it's not the school that defines your research, it's the person. And I'm the type of person that has a vision of where I'm going. I know how to work with students. I have brought in my own money before. So isn't that what any school wants? Type of thing. Um, and that's a part of knowing your work, right? Like I have um, mentored undergrads before. And so I told them like, you know, even though I'm not at an MIT, um, I have worked with a lot of students before. I have a clear definition of where I want to go in the future. And I know that I'm going to be successful no matter where I am 
because I know that I need to bring in grants from NSF and I've been going to these future faculty workshops to prepare for this moment. You know, I, you might have practiced being a TA. I know how to teach courses and I'm not going to need a lot of prep time because I'm very efficient at my teaching. I mean, everybody can be more efficient. Just You are efficient at your teaching, right? And people learn stuff. And then two, like I've worked, I know how to collaborate. I know how to get a project done. And at the end of the day, it's about what I can deliver, not where I've been. So. Did you have a question? Yeah, um, tenure track, I mean, I, I know it might be really detailed, just a general overview, because as soon as you get hired, what they, they put you on the tenure track, uh, track, and it's like five or six years, just a general of what that entails. Okay, um, so yes, when you, the, the goal is to get hired into a tenure track job. Um, and you can negotiate for things that would make your life easier. So technically right now, my official title is a postdoctoral researcher in engineering public policy, and I'm an adjunct faculty member in civil and environmental engineering. So this has given me an extra year on the tenure clock because I have signed both contracts for my, for the, my first year and my second year. So my second year, this automatically switches to an assistant professor tenure track position. There is no negotiating anymore because I've signed a contract, I have the paper, it's saved on my computer, right? <laughs> um, and so when you get on the tenure track, um, you have to teach, you gotta bring in money, and you gotta get a student. And so um, if you're in a place where your tenure track is six years, that means you have five years to prove yourself um, and to say, hey, I can bring in money, I can ramp up quickly, I can train people to do good work, and I can still publish, right? So you have to get really good at delegating really fast. That's why if you have the opportunity to mentor undergrads and help them with, get them to help you with your research, I highly recommend it um, because it just helps you practice delegating before you are judged on whether or not you're a good delegator. Um, and so for me, I just had undergrads collecting data for me. I had them um, making graphs for me off of data I already had collected. I like had asked some of them to help me write a lit review and like was just trying to guide them about how do you write a paper. Um, and so I'm gonna tell you, sometimes it's rough when you're, when, when you're working with people that have never done research before. Um, and I had one student that was always fighting me. Like, you know, you always thought it was busy work. And I was like, dude, <laughs> this code has got to be written by somebody. If you don't write it, I gotta write it. And I've been training you to write it, so it's in your messages to just write it. And so we were just butting heads. And so that also helped me see what type of personality I didn't want in a grad student, right? Um, because the, you know you don't want to find out what personalities you don't click with when you only have like a couple years left to get your tenure to get your papers done, right? You want to make sure you're meshing like from the beginning. Um, and so like you know I just kind of had to be right. I had to be real with him, like, dude, this is not busy work. You are a volunteer in my lab. You can leave right now, no hard feelings. But like, if you come to me one more week with an excuse about why you didn't do anything, like, I'm gonna lose it. So let's just cut it now. You can either leave or you can do some work. And he said, okay, I'm gonna let you know. And I'm like, no, you gotta decide right now. If, do you wanna be here or not? Cause it had been two months, right? And the most valuable thing a PhD has is their time, right? And so he said, okay, I wanna work here. I said, okay, then do some work. And you can work in my office now for two hours a week. And that's your commitment. You know he finished that code in two weeks? It in two months. <laughs> and I'm just like, you've got to be kidding me, right? Um, but that also helped me know, like, it doesn't do me any good holding on to people that aren't doing any work, right? And so that whole, like, cutting it off early, recognizing who it is from the beginning, helps you out a lot because right now, um, so since I got hired, I, I signed my official contract in March, right? Somebody had messaged me on LinkedIn saying that they're interested in getting a PhD in May. And I hired him in August because at Carnegie, I, can, I have autonomy to hire who I want. Now other schools, you don't. You normally, you get a pool of applicants into the grad program and sometimes it's a situation where the school admits a certain number of PhDs and then you pick from those. But at Carnegie, you, it's not like that. 
the professors pick the PhDs. And so if a student doesn't have somebody who's interested in working with them on that particular topic or their project, it's not that they're not a good student, it's just that there was the money in their area that they were interested in or people just had too many students at the time. So basically I had told him like, okay, send me your materials, right? That's the stay ready part. All right, so send me your materials, tell me what you wanna do. So he sent me the materials, say it looks good. And I asked my colleagues like, why wasn't this guy hired? And he had a, it's like not a high GPA, not a low GPA, kind of average. And they say he just fell below the radar. You know, he's, he's one of those people that slips through. Um, and he had a bad, bad first year, great last years, but you know, the GPA, it tells you the average of all the years. So you didn't see this exponential growth, right? And so hired him, he's great. Like he reminds me of some of the undergrads that I worked with that we never had any problems, right? He's a great thinker. He's always coming up with new ideas and he can deliver, right? Um, and then I've had, so I've gone from one student in May emailing me, I've, had, I've met with, I think, 20 students this year, all wanting to work with me. And I'm just like, oh my God, like, I have only been here since August and I'm not even like officially titled yet, right? And so as you can imagine this exponential growth, you just have these waves of people coming in all wanting to like work on what you want to work on. And you're just like, how do I choose, right? It's impossible. Cause like, and you just want to tell these people like, it's not that you're bad. Like, I just don't have money. Um, and so, sorry, I'm diverging. I'm an ever in a flower. I just talk. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you gotta, you want to make sure that you're trying to pick somebody whose personality matches with what you think it takes to be successful. Um, sorry, I was gonna go into a little bit more. Oh, go ahead. Okay, and so then that's why when you do get your offer, you wanna make sure that you're prepared to negotiate for what it's gonna take to be successful. So key things you can negotiate for are startup money to build your lab, so that's getting your equipment, all that good stuff. Um, student years, right? So they should pay you a certain amount of money to fund students. Right, and so you can try to negotiate for that. Your salary, of course, is something you should negotiate for. And lab space for your students, lab space for your equipment, should you need it. I'm on the computer only, so I don't need um, lab equipment. But, so then I could actually try to negotiate a little bit more for the student years. And then travel funds, so a discretionary fund. So that's the money that you're gonna use to get your name out there, to go to conferences, to do things like talk to your alma mater and try to help people get jobs in academia. Um, that was a joke. I'm sorry. I got it. I got it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's a good thing. As far as your work, uh, like in this area, should a PhD start at 60, 65? I'm trying to get a ballpark of what uh, what they start on. What's your um, degrees? Uh, the one we're getting, uh, which is first year students, is applied science and technology. Well, mine is a concentration in chemistry. Okay. Um, so one, you're not just first year PhD students, you're a first year PhD student, just makes it sound less valuable, right? Okay. You're valuable, know your worth. So don't say uh, just, okay. No, right. <laughs> no, it's like, okay. I'm not just a second year, I'm not just an assistant professor, I am an assistant professor, right? And I am here, I'm not just here, I am here, right? Mm -hmm. um, they say women do it a lot, I used to do it too. We also, okay. They also say women apologize a lot, I try to stop apologizing oh, okay. for things that are not necessary. Um, so in that field, I don't know, to be honest. Um, what you can, you, what are you with you? I'm industrial engineering. Industrial engineering? Yes. So, um, so you can look online, right? There's yeah, you can look on like Glassdoor, yes. indeed. Yes. Um, for yes. public yes. universities, their yes. salaries are online, actually. Yes. So you can look them up. It's just um, important to remember that when you're looking at professor salaries, there are nine month salaries, not 12 month salaries. Yeah. So um, that also helps. Yeah. If, if you, I, I had a, 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 I had an advisor, but he didn't have any money. And I asked him, does, do you at least have money, even if you can't pay for my tuition or anything, do you at least have money for the chemicals for the research that I was going to be doing with him? And he said no. And he didn't have any money at all. And then I said, well, let me look in the department to see who else has money. But I found somebody with the personality just don't. I mean, he's like, I think he has bipolar. It's like, 
you don't know, he'll come up to you and, hey, he's smiling real quick. And then at the meeting, the group meeting, he'll just go down your throat. You should have known that in 106. I don't even know how you made it this far. And just a critical at you. And I'm like, wow. And he's doing it to other people that's been in this team. And I'm like, wow, you see what you're going to get, you know. And, and then, so, you know, I'm like, and then he has an audition. So I'm in the audition thing. He says, I had to audition. I had to synthesize a compound, get an article, synthesize it with no help, do it myself, and then he'll decide whether or not I can make his team. But he's allowed me to come to the team meeting. So I'm like, and then when you said personality, I already know that, you know, it's hard for me if you want to, if I'm doing something wrong to, to, make me feel so bad in front of people. I'd rather you do it alone in the group. You just got to yell at me fine. But when you do it at a group meeting in front of other people, it just, I'm just, I just like, ooh. You know, yeah. that, so, that bothers me, that's all. And you're in your first year, right? Yes. So I would say that um, it's in your best interest to find somebody you click with because um, your advisor is key in your PhD. Um, so a lot of times it doesn't, like people look at the name last. A lot of times they ask who your advisor was. Your advisor has to give you recommendation letters. I mean, you are like working so closely with somebody and they are the one person that decides when you leave, right? So it's in your best interest to make, yeah, to look around, not just be focused only on the money, um, even though money is important, not, no denying it there. Um, but it's like the PhD is the one job where your boss is to tell you when you can leave. And that's the type of thing that separates a four-year PhD from a seven, 10-year PhD. Um, so it is important. On my blog, I do have like how to pick a great advisor, questions you should ask to help illuminate who you might want to work with. Um, and so maybe some of those questions will also help you try to find other people in the department. Okay. Yep. I was just going to add, add, add to what you said. Some, some of the things that you mentioned about, about this person, I mean, only you can evaluate it. Uh, and I, I'm not, not, not trying to necessarily defend the, the person, but uh, sometimes, you know, in fact, we, we're kind of brutally honest, you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, so just kind of be careful, is it really a personality conflict or is he just saying, hey, look, you guys aren't meshing, stepping up. And uh, as a PhD, you shouldn't be afraid to, to hear that. You know, if, if it is a case where, you know, he said this person should have known this in these previous classes. You know, uh, when you get to this level, you're not you're not expected to be the one asking the question. You're expected to be the one answering the question. And if this person is not bringing their previous knowledge that they're supposed to have from, you know, a freshman level course or what have you, then, uh, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a bad. Maybe maybe he could have said it best bluntly or what have you, but if that's the sort of thing, you know, so just be careful before you kind of cast this person off as, you know, especially if they have funding and they've got a good reputation. Yeah, millions of dollars. Right, yeah, so, millions. Right, right, you know, <laughs> right, and some of that brilliance, you know, that whole iron sharpens iron and everything, yeah, maybe, maybe the person is kind of blunt and both, whatever those things are, but just kind of look beneath the surface and say, hey, look, is he just attacking or is it saying, hey, look, I didn't, Right, I messed up. I shouldn't. I shouldn't just. I, I, I should know that. I should know that stuff, you know, in in front of people. I mean, yeah. With it. So, in other words, if you're used to people talking to you in a kind manner, you may have to let that go, in order to get what you want. And you may just find an advisor that is not kind with his words, and just settle for that in order to get what you want. That's what. I, that's what I'm asking. And, and, and is, that, is that a trade off? I wouldn't necessarily go, go that far. I'm just saying True. don't. But because this person was brutally honest and mean to this person that you observed or what have you, I'm, I'm not saying go to that person. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying kind of dig, you know, observe, observe a little bit more to see, you, you know, where where things are. If, if I come in prepared, I don't have anything to worry about. You know, if I do what's expected, like like the student she had that she mentioned, the freshman, you know, eventually it came to the point. Look, you got to cut bait. <laughs> Either do the work or you're out of here. And the student stepped up. And now, and they was able to, you know, further that relationship. And perhaps you'd be the same way. Say, look, I came prepared every week, and I had my stuff, and I had no problems with it. Yeah. So you have to try to use your best friend. Right. Yeah. Okay.
I guess getting the job for an international student wouldn't be the same as you, right? Why? I mean, uh, from what I've heard, uh, most of the companies wouldn't want to hire international students. I mean, they have to sponsor you. I mean, I'm not sure. I'm just, I you just heard, want to. You've heard it from know. companies or you've heard it from other PhDs? Uh, other students have heard. Okay. So, I mean, one thing that I tend to recommend to people is don't take advice from people that are in the situation you want to be in. Okay, so a lot of times, yeah, like um, at a, in undergrad, I had a very unpopular, I was very unpopular because I just said I don't take advice from people that are doing worse than me in class, right? I would not, I would not recommend it. Um, so if somebody in the companies that you want to work for is telling you like, you know, they're not hiring internationals, then you move on to a different company, right? And that is why I say networking happens before you are looking for a job, because you want to have your um, efforts be directed and focused. And you want to focus on people that are going to know your worth, right? You got to know your worth, so you can. I mean, like there are people that make exceptions to people all the time, because people want to work with their friends. Now in academia, ton of internationals. I mean, so I was for internship. Uh, for internships, I mean, it's hard for internships for PhDs, no matter who you are. I've had one internship in my PhD, um, but even that was kind of difficult to get. So, and I don't know many PhDs that do internships. Um, so I would say, like, it's kind of a hit or miss, no matter who you are. Um, yeah, but I mean, job after, it's like most academics are internationals. Um, a lot of companies will hire who they want to bring the skills to the table that they, that they need. Um, and so, like, you know, if you're going into it with the mindset of it's hard to get a job because I'm an international, it will be hard to get a job because you're not gonna be your best self, right? You're not gonna be as confident. And like, there'll be plenty of people that will tell you why you shouldn't get the job or why it's hard to get the job, and you shouldn't be one of those people. Just let other people do that work for you. Okay, any other questions? So uh, for networking, can you give some quick tips how we can start like I'm at my second year of PhD. So how can I start from now? Okay, um, so I also have a blog networking in five minutes or less, but uh, highlights would be um, when you go to a conference mm -hmm. and if you're the type of person like me that gets overwhelmed in big crowds, um, one, try to show up to the conference venue a little early, like wherever you're sitting so you can talk to people as they come in. But two, um, if you know that you're going to this conference and you want to meet with somebody who's going to be there, try to set the, up the meeting before you get to the conference, right? So you can reach out to them a month before. Hey, I saw that you're giving a talk and this. My name is blah, 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 blah. My work is blah, 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 blah. Like, and I'm really interested in hearing about your path, learning more about this paper, learning like how you started this research project and like, its development, et cetera. Right? And so one, you've already prepared for the questions. And then since you have reached out in advance, a lot of people don't do that, and it'll make you a little bit more memorable, right? Um, networking is like, for, for when you meet people, if you meet them at a conference, email them before you go to sleep. Because people are checking their email during the conference, but after they leave the conference, their emails are flooded. And they're not going to, um, they're not gonna remember you as much. So you can say like, hi, like, it was great to meet you at lunch today. Um, I really enjoyed our conversation on blah, 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 blah. Um, I do business cards. I know a lot of people are fans of LinkedIn, but I am personally not a fan of only networking on LinkedIn because you don't have a reason to follow up after the conference, right? And so if you take a business card, if you give them your business card, it's an invitation for them to give you one back, right? So when they give me the business card, then, I, when I turn the corner, I write on the back of it who they were, what they said, and one thing I want to follow up about. Right? It makes it easier to just have a meaningful email. And people actually did notice that I do that. They're like, oh, wow, like, I'm really happy that you remember a conversation. Like, I had a great conversation with you, too. Um, people were really impressed that I emailed them before the conference was over. And it also just makes it easier on you because it's like you're not trying to remember, like, 10 people that you met with. Um, and then like sometimes, like, so when I was in the job market, you know, some people are kind of like this, 
I'm going to apply to everything, throw it at the wall and see what sticks. I'm more of like a grassroots, like, let me cultivate this right now because I'm really tired and I can handle you in small batches, but I can't do it all. Right. And so I would, um, when I was on the job market, I would start emailing some of the people that I really connected with or that I felt a connection enough with that I felt comfortable emailing them. And I'm like, hi, Alexandra, it was great to meet you. Like, um, at the conference, like last year or two years ago, I'm on the job market this year and I noticed that you had a position open in your department. And I was wondering if you thought that I would be a good fit, right? So now you're telling them that you remember who they are. You're asking them if they think you're a good fit for this job. And half the time with, um, interviews, it's just about getting people to read your application because they get 200 and you want somebody to read it in detail. You want somebody to be like your advocate, your champion, like this person is like a leader, right? Um, so yeah. So you were suggesting about some tips of resume. Um, so I mean, like, I would just look at other people's resume. If you guys want some of the free stuff over there, please feel free as well. Uh, there's buttons, there's notebooks and pens and stuff. Um, thank you for coming. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, there's examples of research statements and teaching statements online. Like, I also have mine that people ask me for, I send it out. Um, and then you also have, like, your advisors, you have other friends that recently went on the job market. Like, ask for the people who are successful, right? I cannot stress that enough. Do not just take anybody's research statement, take the successful research statement. Right. Um, and like then when you're in the job, you can also ask people for if they would feel comfortable sharing an example of a grant that they wrote. Right. Or if, if people would be OK, like reading your statement. And so sometimes I saw that people had a job opening in their department and but they were my mentor. I didn't just want to be like, hey, will you tell your people to hire me for this job? Right. I want to be like, hey, would you be OK reading my research statement because I'm going on the job market this year? And I really want to make sure that it's good and I really value your opinion. Then they could tell me like, oh, like your research statement looks good or, oh, it's like too much text, too much dissertation, like you need to focus more on this and this, like, and then after that, I think that you should apply to like, you know, this one at University of Florida or this one at Virginia Tech or blah, 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 right? Like I know a guy there. Some one, one guy who was my mentor had a student that got a job at a different school and then I, met with that student and they talked to me about the department. I learned a lot of stuff like I put the PhD and master's materials over there. Somebody sent me that. Hey, this is like what the department cares about. FYI. Right? Little information that makes your life easier. Right? That helps you know what these people care about. If you're looking at the department and they're really strong in energy and all their stuff is in energy, then you know that that's one thing they care about and you want to show how you can collaborate with people, not compete against people. Right? Yeah. How did you, um, I guess, know which conferences was right for you to help mold uh, the career path that you wanted to do in academia? Um, so it's funny because the conference I went to every year is not where I met the people who gave me my job, right? Um, so in my last year, I just was applying to a lot of the um, like uh, travel grants to go to conferences. I, I think I went to four conferences that year. One was my like big academic conference, which is Informs, it's for industrial engineering. And so when people told me, like Informs is where people interview, I knew, okay, like a lot of schools recruit from there because that's where all these interviews are. Um, and my advisor said, this conference is important for our field, right? So since she told me that, I mean, that was like a no brainer. Like if I wanna meet people like collaborate with, meet people that are like leaders in the field, that's where I go. Then somebody told me about Institute Teaching and Mentoring, right? So then they told me, Institute of Teaching Mentoring is the largest gathering of black PhDs in the country. And there's a lot of schools that send people there to recruit minority candidates. So I said, okay. On, when I am actually on the job market, and the year before I was on the job market, I went there to talk to those people at the career fair. And um, two people that I met at the career fair the year before I was on the job market, like basically flew me out to their school to give a grad student seminar. And the guy since seminar was my practice, like the guy there was the one that told me like, hey, when I asked you what classes you could teach, you only told me grad school classes. I'm an department chair. We need undergrad classes. We need grad classes and we need new classes. Nobody, like nobody else has told me that since, 
But because he told me that, I'm like, okay, like now I know how department chairs think, right? right. And it was really valuable. I mean, um, I like went to Auburn to get a grad student seminar and the guy and me, like we really clicked. I clicked with some people in the apartment, but they were hiring and manufacturing the next year, right? So right. they knew about me and they were like, we hoped we could get some money for energy, but it just wasn't in their focus, but it was practice. Yeah. So uh, I recently got hired. One of the things um, that they told me about was teaching opportunities. I got hired by um, a company, uh, industry or government job, and they were telling me about teaching opportunities. That's why I was wondering because I, you know I wasn't aware of uh, I guess the collaboration process or how you how you use your networking to sort of expand on expand on that from conferences and stuff like that. Mm, so when I'm at a conference, like, and I see a talk that I'm interested in or like somebody's work that I'm interested in, I, I kind of just go up and ask them like, hey, have you thought about this? Have you looked into doing this? Like, this is what I do. I'm like interested in that. Are you interested in that? And, you know, I, I met a lady and she was like, oh, like I'm actually writing a paper on that. I'll send it to you. Maybe we can like think about something later, right? And then six months later, I just try to reach out again. So like, hey, like, I know you write that paper. Did, you, did it get published? You know, are you still interested in working together? She's like, yeah, we're gonna like, now we're actually working together. It's like a year later, okay. right? But like, for me, what I do is sometimes if I know that I really, if I felt like I really clicked with somebody, I like their work, I put on my Google calendar to reach out six months later. Gotcha. And then I'm like, okay, like here's their email. Here's what I wanted to reach out about. And it's just like a reminder that pops up in six months. Um, and that helps me a lot. Okay. Yeah, for one more question. I think I saw something. No? Okay.